Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Dieter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. I hope you're having a good day, whatever day it is that you happen to be listening to the show or watching the show on YouTube. My fishing channel on YouTube, Dieter Melhorn Fishing, has a video version of this podcast. So if you're listening on any of the audio platforms out there, which I think we're on about seven or eight of them now, uh, you can jump over to YouTube and you can actually watch uh, the podcast if you like doing that so appreciate you checking it out um if you want to give me some feedback send me a message let me know what you think give me some show ideas go to my website dietermelhornfishing.com there's a contact section on there you can uh, fire off an email so uh, appreciate all the regular listeners coming back appreciate y'all checking it out staying with the channel and if you're new Welcome. Appreciate you checking it out. What we're going to talk about today is the Catfish Conference, and we actually uh, have a guest that I interviewed last year at the Catfish Conference uh, that I'm going to talk with. We'll get into that in a minute, but uh, the uh, you know the taping of this show were early 2023, and uh, I taped this interview last year at the Catfish Conference uh, with Hervé Drompt, who is one of the uh, he was one of the initial people that helped start the Catfish Conference. Everybody knows Steve Douglas. I did a podcast with him uh, last year. Uh, I taped it at the Catfish Conference. Everybody kind of knows Steve as the face of the Catfish Conference. Understandably so. He's the catfish dude on YouTube and a known face. And um, But Herving is kind of a behind-the-scenes guy. And uh, he's not your typical catfish guy. He has one of those funny names just like mine. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it'll be an interesting podcast with him. You'll get a little insight into who he is. And when you see him running around at the Catfish Conference, you'll know who he is. But let's say this about the Catfish Conference. It's not the Catfish Conference anymore. It's the Catfish and Crappie Conference. This year, they are adding crappie vendors to the show. So uh, it's still going to be at the Louisville Expo Center, our Kentucky Expo Center in Louisville, uh, February 24th and 25th. And uh, as big as ever, a lot of vendors are there. Uh, this is really the first full year back in full swing since COVID, believe it or not. Um, go back to 2020, we didn't have a, um, uh, well, actually we had one in 2020, 2021 we did not have an actual show uh they did everything remotely on the internet and uh a virtual show so to speak wasn't the same everybody agrees and understands that uh last year was the first time back now last year there were some supply chain issues that people were dealing with was still getting stuff we were still in that mode of of, of coming out of the covid world uh, you know, this year, everything should be back to normal. It should be back full swing um, and, you know, with no issues with getting stuff, none of that. Everybody's had time to get up to speed. So this is going to be the first one back. And they've added crappie vendors, uh, crappie eaters, going to be some crappie fishing seminars. And I think it's a smart move for the show. Um, crappie fishing and catfish kind of go a little more hand in hand than some other types of fishing. Crappie are widespread. They're in a lot of the same waters that catfish are in. And uh, uh, there's a lot of, I guess you could call it cross-pollination uh, between crappie fishermen and catfish fishermen. I fish for crappie too. I have a few videos on my channel. Uh, luckily, where I'm at, uh, we can use crappie for catfish bait. So that's how I learned to fish for them. But they're a very popular uh you know game fish pretty much anywhere in the country so there's going to be a lot of vendors there i think it's going to be really good i think it's going to open up more fishing stuff uh will be there uh just a wide range of stuff probably will open up the market for some more boats to come in also so uh, I, I i'm i'm glad to see that happening sadly I will not be there this year. I've got some other obligations. Uh, they're going to keep me away, so I'm going to miss it. And I hate that because this would be a good year to be there. I would love to see all the new crappie stuff that they're adding. But it is what it is. Uh, you know, the, 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 I'm going to miss it. So you guys enjoy it. As I always tell people about going to this show, the Catfish and Crappie Conference now, 
is you're going to get to see pretty much everything in the catfishing world that you could ever want to buy. And you'll be able to pick it up, touch it, hold it, and, you know, lay your hands on it and see what it looks like versus looking at it online, watching it on my YouTube channel, whatever. You can actually see this stuff. You can see the people who are behind the companies that make all this stuff. So it's really cool. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of other stuff going on. The, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the award shows that go on. ACA has a thing going on there with their uh, Hall of Fame inductees. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. So uh, it's well worth going to. Go to the Catfish Conference website. I believe it's catfishconference.com. And uh, see what all's going on. See what the schedule looks like. And, uh, you know, see what's there. It used to be you had to get there on the first day because they sold out of it everything. Now I think people are better stocked with gear. And uh, I, I don't think you'll have a problem with running out of stuff. One of the biggest things there, biggest advantages for going to the show is buying fishing rods. Uh, one, you get to lay your hand on every fishing rod that is made out there in the catfish world. It doesn't matter who makes them. I've got the Hellcats. They've got every other brand out there made. Uh, Catch the Fever has a huge booth. Uh, Chris Flores from Muddy River Catfishing, he'll have his uh, rods over there on display. Uh, Mad Cats will be there with a big display of rods. And then all your other ones, Whisker Seeker, uh, right on down the line, there will be people there that will have these rods. And one, you get to actually pick these rods up, touch them, hold them, feel them, see what works for you, see what you like. Biggest thing is you don't have to pay shipping on these rods. When you order these rods anywhere, shipping is what always kills you. Uh, just getting those things shipped to you. It's expensive. And, uh, you know, you don't have to pay that there. By the way, I don't know if they will honor it there or not. But if you order any Big Cat Fever rods, promo code CATFISH on the website. I don't think it'll work at the show. I don't know. Maybe if you twist Caleb's arm and tell him I mentioned this here, he might give you the discount. Try it and see. I don't know, but I know it works online. Uh, catfish. Use the promo code catfish at the Catch the Fever website. And uh, it works actually at a bunch of places. Uh, there's, a, I think, PC Fun honors it. Uh, there's, there's several ones. Go to my website, DieterMillhornFishing.com. Right here on the front of the page, there's a list of all the uh, partners that use the promo code CATFISH to give you a discount. Grundens, who makes rain gear, uses CATFISH20. So if you ever buy any Grundens gear, use the promo code CATFISH20. So anyway, enough with uh, where to buy stuff on the cheap. We're going to get into this podcast. I think it'll be interesting. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, a bunch of fishing stuff, but it gives you some good background just on the show, how it's evolved, where it's going, what all's involved in. And I think Hervey has a good perspective different than a lot of us. Um, you know, a bunch of us are very, uh, I'll call myself narrow minded into the catfish world. We have a very narrow vision of things. And I think Hervey, a more worldly guy than myself and some others. Uh, I think he's got a different vision and a different look on it. And I think that's very healthy and it's very good for the catfish conference. And I think it's why it's now the catfish and crappie conference. I think that insight and wisdom and outlook on it has helped. And uh, I think he's a cool guy. If you get to see him, tell him you saw the podcast here and uh, we'll get into it. Give me a little background on you. You are not our normal catfish fish person uh on visual appearances and what we hear tell me your background <laughs> i'm i'm swiss i was born uh, in geneva and uh yeah i lived in the middle east met my wife over there she brought me back to the u.s so i'm the imported product of the family and uh yeah i've been here since what 2014 15 yeah very cool. So she's from the United States? She's from Kentucky. Wow. Now there's a very interesting mix. Kentucky, Swiss, Middle East coming together. You know, when, when it's meant to be, it's just meant to be, I guess. Like, and, and that's what I've seen everywhere. I think, you know, you, you see people just from random origins, just like get together and for them, I mean, it's just it's life, you know? Now, did you grow up with any connection to fishing? As a kid? No. 
Not really. So as far as I can remember, and I was actually thinking about that uh, last night, uh, I went fishing perhaps a couple of times with my dad, but it was in one of her, I guess it was my great grandma's house in France. So we had like a small river that just like, or it's not even a river, it's like something even smaller uh, that was crossing the village. And we used to go with like tiny rods and you know, the tiniest little hooks and it was fish the size of my you know, little finger. And so we just go there and just get those little things and toss them back. And, and uh, I don't know, it must have been what, five, six, I don't remember. And that was not exactly a thing, I mean, uh, my family was doing. And so when I came to the US, like you discover a, a brand new world. It's, uh, it's, it's something people do, especially in the Midwest, when you're out of you know, bigger cities. It's um, like a family tradition, almost, like hunting in some ways. It's kind of you know, the same family. So I discovered something that was totally foreign to me, totally foreign. And that, that is one of the things we kind of take for granted, I guess, or expect or whatever, that fishing is not something everybody does uh, in every part of the world. They may not have access to the water, may not be that good at fishing. Financially, it's basically a pastime, mm -hmm. and it's something that you don't always have a connection to. Mm -hmm. And when you got to the U.S., did your American wife introduce you to it through family or anything, or was it still a ways off before you? It was ways off. So on my, my wife's side, they were more on the hunting side of things. They go sometimes fishing, they're, you know, there's a pond somewhere, so they, they used to do that. Yeah. But it was not really, you know, at the, on the plat du jour once I arrived. And so we were, I was introduced to catfishing in general through Jeff Jones. He's my uncle-in-law, and so through the boat dealership and through his association with Steve Douglas uh, and the YouTube type of you know arena, at the time that's how I kind of got to understand and, and see catfishing for you know what it was. So back up and explain that to people that don't know. Jeff Jones was part of the original in the parking lot catfish conference. So initially there was Jeff Jones, uh, my wife and I and uh, Jim Hopper and Steve Douglas. And so with time, Jim Hopper decided to do something else. And then it was just Jeff, Steve, uh, my wife and I, we just did the whole thing. And it, <laughs> it started as an accident. It keeps being a happy accident every year. Uh, that there's no, there's no glory in that. It's just, it's just life. Things get together and it ends up being a success uh, most of the time. So we, it's, it's accident and luck. Well, and you say luck, and to a large extent, was I talked to Steve about it, and most entrepreneurial stories have, you know, some, there, there's, you know, they're a Disney story. If you have this dream, and then you have this confrontation, and something that stops you, y'all have had kind of a, there hasn't, I mean, outside of some, you know, some little stuff here, there hasn't been anything like super duper horribly bad. You've Hit it at a good time, so to speak. Not, not really, yeah. We were just there at the right time with the right people, the right moment, and everybody had the right intentions. It was all about the passion, and it was totally uninterested uh, on the financial side of things. We we're just there to make it work, uh, and, and we just grew around that. The make it work, and the yeah, let's keep on doing that for, for other people out there. So at, what's your background that makes this a strong suit for you? Because obviously you, you've got a place in this outside of the ability to speak catfish. What's your strong suit in that world? So I had organized conferences in the past, uh, more on the, on the political and uh, I guess more high level, uh, I guess, topics um, overseas. Yeah. And so um, I had a I guess I had seen conferences made from the inside, but it was a totally different animal in some ways because, I mean, first of all, it, the, the region does not apply the same rules to, to here. And um, here's in the sport, something that was totally foreign to me and a sport that I didn't know, I did not practice. Um, so it's, I had to learn from scratch and I learned by watching like everybody else, YouTube, who is who, who's doing what and what are the brands. And, you know, getting to know the, I mean, the owners of these brands, watching them grow. And of course, I mean, I was heavily involved in all the, on the business side and marketing side, but it was very interesting to see how 
all of these guys were actually growing with us. So we we're, we're more like a reflection of what catfishing as a, as a sport, as a community is. We're, we're nothing. It's all about everybody, all those brands, all those people, that passion, the YouTubers. It's that weird ecosystem that kind of floats and sticks together and uh, makes some happy accident for everybody else out there. Now, has it been kind of interesting, shocking, surprising to see that and learn it? Because I'm sure, you know, if you're, you would think that coming into this, you're like, wait a minute, these guys are fishing for these ugly fish that swim in the bottom of the lake. And, and then to see this whole thing kind of come together in a way, has it been surprising? And what, is, what have you seen there? So not knowing anything about fishing, I mean, a plain zero about fishing, and you have to learn, I had a hard time understanding why catfishing had a bad kind of connotation. It made no sense to me. Catfish was a fish that just lived differently, behaved differently, but to me it was a fish. And so I didn't see why people were kind of putting catfishing down compared to other type of sports. And at the end of the day, you know, I think it's more like elitism. Once you have your sport, you want to make it, you know, something mystic around it. You make it more complex than what it really is. And, and so, I think that was one of the um, strangest things about catfishing. But once you get to know people and you see that, you know, it's not only catfishing, but catfishermen come from all backgrounds, they come from all type of fishing, and they enjoy their time tremendously. I mean, it's, it's pressure free. You go to enjoy yourself and just, just be yourself. It's not something that, you know, you have to pretend to be somebody else or, you know, be one of those like elite type of anglers. And, you know, you, you don't have that pressure. Catfishing is, is real, and, and that's like a lot of Americans out there, and not Americans only. I mean, it's, you know, it could be Canadians, could be you know South Americans, wherever you're from, doesn't matter. I mean, there's catfishing, you know, in many places in the world. We even have talked to people that are in South Africa. They have the South African catfish out there, and they're just looking for gear coming from the U.S. because we make it specially for catfish, and they have an interest. So, we're, you know, the world is connected, and I think the passion for catfishing is. It's just growing. It's just yeah. there. Is there, you, you've been around the world. Is there any, is there fishing cultures in some of these other countries or is that something kind of unique? And I, and I know there's fishing culture in the sense of commercial fishing, fishing for food and that kind of thing, but recreational fishing, is that something kind of unique to the United States? At the level we I, experience it. I, I think, you know, in, in for what I know, uh, I think, you know, there are some countries in Europe that, you know, they, they fish. It's, a, you know, also a family tradition, but it depends where you live. Like, you need to have that body of water. It's got to be safe. Uh, you got to have to have the financial means to, you know, just to buy your stuff and just do it on a recreational basis. And, and I think most of the countries that travel to, they were fishing, you know, by tradition, but it was on a, uh, on a need basis. They need the fish to eat and, and live and survive. So it's part of like a... Um, not to want to say a survival, but it's survival mechanism. But it's more like a, a societal need. You have to do that to, you know, to stick together and just to, to live your life, basically. And so in that sense, uh, I've seen people enjoying their, their livelihoods, what they were doing uh, in the fishing space um, around that. I mean, they're enjoying their lives the way they can, and fishing was in the center. Um, and mostly in Asia, I think people have a passion for, for fishing more than Europe and perhaps yeah. uh, certain. Uh, this is what, the fifth, sixth year, sixth year? Uh, starting in 16, so it must be the sixth or seventh edition. Yeah, I don't even know now. Yeah, keep up with it. Yeah. What kind of, uh, what sticks out as far as an evolution that you've seen take place in this? Uh, obviously the size, but anything else that kind of sticks out as far as you've seen the growth of this thing and the people, the vendors? <sighs> I think YouTube. YouTube has played a tremendous part in the growth of the sport. Um, I think people feel, you know, they, they see the example of all those, those guys. I mean, yourself, but there's Steve, there's so many out there. Uh, and small channels, irrespective of number of subscribers. But it's, it's more about um, believing in yourself and doing, you know, doing you. I mean, you, you're there and you, you know, record your thing and you just enjoy your you're fishing and what's what's around fishing and I think people have been emboldened um, and they're following the lead of, of many out there and I think it's for it's for the best it helps brands grow it helps the sport grow but on, on many level I think it did help people 
move forward with their lives and, and have the guts to do uh, things they would have, wouldn't have done. Yeah. I mean, I talked to um, Alex Nagy, and you know, he's, I just talked to him a second ago, and he was saying how you know, all YouTube and you know, talking to, to these guys uh, really empowered him to grow in the, you know, the shoes of like a business owner, and now with Doug, they're owning uh, uh, Ripping Lips. But they went from passion to uh, we'd like to do something to now we're running the business and it's it's something it's it's big so I'm absolutely thrilled to see all those beautiful steps and success stories it's it's beautiful to see yeah what do you think um, what do you think the growth potential is in the catfish market not necessarily the conference itself we'll get to that in a second but what do you think that growth potential is for whether it be Tournaments, boats, fishermen, rods, tackle, what kind of, what do you see out there? You seem to have a pretty good hand on the pulse of what's yeah. going on with the vendors that are here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, we're obviously on the, hopefully, the, the way out of a pandemic. And I think that changed the dynamic of things and the dynamic of families in general. So there's a, a sort of reality check. You come back to something that's real, you know, you, you go back to, fishing, you go back to something that really kind of brings some peace in your life. And, and I see more and more people just taking the recent events as a, as a moment to reflect upon themselves and just to, to go back and reconnect with their families. And, and just de facto, I think it's going to create a new generation um, of fishermen out there and the younger and even the older. I mean, you know, you reconnect, you know, looking down towards the age, but also, you know, with your parents, depending on how old you are, and maybe your grandparents. And you go and spend some time together, and, and I think that just opens, if you talk about numbers, it creates a bigger market for everybody. And, and of course, that comes with, you know, more companies, more choices, more rods, and this and that. I mean, you know, it's, it's an entire ecosystem that's connected together. So there's a lot of space. And I'm sure we're going to grow millions of anglers within the next couple of years, faster than any other type of fishing, most likely. I mean, that's what people say, and I believe that. Yeah. Do you think the YouTube social media world has helped with what you were talking about earlier, catfishing having this stigma? Uh, you know, a lot of it's perpetuated by cable TV, the hand-grabbing shows, and they really try to make it as redneck as possible. Mm -hmm. Do you think YouTube social media has helped it go in a positive direction? Because let's face it, catfishing has gotten very technical. Uh, the boats, Sea Arc has some great boats out here. A lot of money put into those things, the electronics, the gear that you're using. I mean, it's not just throw out a piece of dead something and hope a fish bites. So social media, it's interesting. It's like a love-hate relationship uh, for, for many, for many out there. If I have to name a platform, I think YouTube has been perhaps the best platform because it allowed people to, to create some content, get good at it, and, and just kind of work their way to, to provide like a real, um, a real image of, you know, it's, it's something private. It's you and your camera, so you don't have the pressure of, of other people commenting or doing, you know, just influencing what you are going to say and how you're going to, you know, behave yourself. So it was a real feedback of, of true anglers out there and they had the courage of being themselves because it takes some courage to put yourself on a camera and just like drop it out there for, for the world. I mean, people don't realize that it's a scary moment and, and I think this was great. Uh, it is great for the community. So YouTube allowed the world or at least America to see the real face of catfishing or, or the real face of anglers. Not as much as Facebook, for example, where it's much more critical and, you know, have those free, you know, it's drama I and mean, it's Facebook I and mean, it's the same for everybody. So uh, I think you have to um, stick with platforms that show real things. And, and YouTube has definitely accomplished that over um, many other things out there. What's the future of the Catfish Conference? I had, I had three or four messages, people saying I'm here. Hey, are they coming here? I heard they're coming here. Are they going to do this? Are they going to do that? Is it going to be back in Kansas? What can you tell us without going into any proprietary details about the conference, the future, and that kind of thing? It's a great question. So we are going to be back in Kansas City. Uh, we're right now talking with the conference center to better understand which dates would be available so we don't fall on hunting season. 
think that was the <laughs> main criticism yep. we, we got. We all said that was going to happen too. Yes, everybody, I mean, we've been warned right and left, but again, it was one of the only options. And that's what, you know, people also have to understand. We don't get to decide, hey, it's going to be that weekend and, you know, everybody has to align. It's a discussion with the centers. Are they available or not? Prices do vary. We have to be mindful of, okay, you're too close from Christmas, so we want to leave you with your family so you don't have to travel, keep that budget for, you know, Christmas shopping instead of like more catfishing gear. So you have to be kind of mindful of where you place that and you have to be out of major events, other fishing events, boat shows. So, you know, we, we don't really have the freedom. People think we, we have to do that. So, but to answer the question, uh, for Kansas City, we're going to try to do that somewhere between October and November. The earlier, the better. But again, um, pending availability of all those centers. So that's the plan for now. For Kentucky, everybody knows now it's the last weekend of February. So you already put that in your calendar. You don't miss that opportunity to book your ticket and do that in advance. It's way cheaper that way. <coughs> um, and we would have plans to come on the East Coast and the South as well. But it, it depends again on how fast the recovery with the pandemic goes. And, you know, it's also a heavy investment for our vendors. They have to order the products way, way ahead. It's a heavy financial, you know, um, uh, commitment for them to do that. And maybe the bigger one, it's not the problem, but smaller ones, they can't necessarily afford to, you know, plan four shows in, in one year. And, and it takes some time for them to be out of work because most of them have a full time job. So you can't expect people just to take, hey, a month off and just buy employer, I'll be back in a month. I mean, you can't do that. So we have to be gradual in what we're doing, but just let us know where you want us to get the same, you know, the, the next conference and we'll do our best to, to be there. But it's going to take us a couple of years to grow in the right way. What all goes well, into figuring out when you're going to do one of these, where you're going to have, I mean, there's a lot, people just go, you know, I, we want to have one in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Why don't you do one there and then like a couple months later do one somewhere else? I mean, like you said, these dates aren't always open. There's logistical issues with vendors. I mean, there's a lot you guys have to consider on all this. There's that. There's pricing from all the vendors. I mean, it goes from, you know, the, the videographers that you're going to have, the type of, you know, uh, I guess decorator that you're gonna have and you have to go through specific people the prices changes from state to state You always have those hidden fees somewhere the hotel the transportation the states the tax aspects of it uh, You have all your own logistics, you know moving your people going and just making sure everything is gonna work You know pretty good understanding where your vendors are coming from the placement the website I mean there's like the contractual part. It's like an endless amount of things to do that You know you, you forget about it and, um, and of course, once you think you've got it figured out, I mean, there's always something going wrong because, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. And so, for example, we arrived over here and, you know, everybody was supposed to be able to just roll in exactly to their spots and the floors were not marked. So just got to jump on it and just do it yourself, measure and just adjust, adapt and, and try to make it work for everybody. But it's, it's a lot of work. And of course, we also are busy. We also have a lot of things to do. So jungling with all of that is... I mean, we have to admit we're pretty last minute. That's, I mean, that's, that's real life. I mean, we are last minute. But, you know, it ends up working pretty good. And, and I think we're lucky as well that uh, all of our crowd, the vendors, are quite tolerant. And, and they know now they're, they're able to trust us and our weaknesses. And they know at the end of the day, it's going to work out. I mean, we'll make it work. And, and other vendors help us. And everybody, uh, everybody is well-intentioned. Uh, but that makes a big difference. How did everything go this year with the supply chain issues with China? A lot of stuff comes in from China. How did, was there, I mean, you would think after, you know, we couldn't do one last year because of COVID, you'd have like a bunch of stuff, but you don't order a bunch of stuff unless you got a place to sell it. How did everything come together this year? What were we seeing in the industry there? It's been rough for a lot of people, precisely because a lot of the, uh, the stuff we use is manufactured in China, rebranded, imported, or I guess exported from there. Um, and a lot of things, a lot of shipments have been just floating in front of Los Angeles for a while. And once it was onshore, uh, well, they didn't have the manpower to transport it on the West Coast. So we've heard stories between six and nine months of wait time between the moment you place your order to the moment you receive your goods. And so for a lot of vendors, I mean, some of them delayed with COVID uh, the amount of stuff that they had ordered. 
But one of the uh, interesting effect of us being, again, not last minute, but we kind of precipitated a conference at the end of 2021 because we felt people needed that and we felt we had an opportunity and we'd worked as much as we could with our vendors, but they were expecting their shipments in the meantime and some of them did not get them. So we had less vendors than expected last minute because they just didn't have anything to sell. So and some of them were there and one of them was catch the fever. I mean, you know, these guys have tons of stuff, but you know, it doesn't matter the size of the company. Everybody was impacted uh, on some level. I think Whisker Seeker took a big hit from what I was hearing too with a bunch of stuff not being able to get what they needed inventory wise. Most likely. I mean, we've not heard the story firsthand, but we, we've heard the same rumors, but it's not specific to them. Everybody has something that comes from, from China or other Asian countries. And, and that's been delayed quite severely. Yeah. But now things are getting back uh, to normal. And perhaps it's a lesson as well for, you know, for us, we have to be more, uh, have plan B or be more self-sustainable as far as where we manufacture our stuff. And you have some other brands that do everything American, which it's great, but it's not necessarily affordable for all the products that you would, you know, consider. So it's that right balance of, you know, of interest, you know, price versus quality versus, you know, doing something pretty made in America or just North America. I mean, it depends on what you want to do. There you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. He's a very nice gentleman, uh, a very gracious man. And uh, he was really, you know, he was really trying to work with me and help me out this year at the Catfish Conference if I was going to be there um, because we taped this stuff uh, there. We taped several podcasts, taped one with Steve Douglas, Josh Roth, who does all the replicas, uh, and we had some other people that we taped stuff with and, uh, you know, they've been very gracious in, uh, helping to, you know, get these areas for us there. Sometimes we had a little noise in the kitchen next to it, but Hey, um, uh, it's nice to have the space there to be able to tape stuff. So I hope you guys are able to make it to the show. The good news is there's a rumor. Uh, some of this stuff, obviously this was taped last year in 2022, uh, since then, there is actually a rumor, and this is just a rumor at this point, that there will probably, probably, likely, maybe, hopefully, be one somewhere on the eastern seaboard during the summer. And uh, maybe in the Carolinas, Virginia, somewhere in that area, uh, something a little more midsummer, and uh, we'll see how that develops and see what happens with that. But, yeah, stay tuned for that. We'll keep you posted on it. You'll know it here, hopefully. It's a weekend I'm able to go so I can actually show up. So I'm going to miss you guys this year, but enjoy it. And uh, until next time, we'll catch you out on the water.